Welcome everyone. I'm Julie Bieland and we were, are recording this episode for the HSP podcast live in my sensitive empowerment community where many of us identify as HSP empaths. And we're so thrilled to be together and to welcome Dr. Judith Orloff today for the healing power of being an empath. Judith Orloff is the New York Times bestselling author of the Empath Survival Guide, a psychiatrist on the UCLA psychiatric clinical faculty and a founder of the empath movement. She synthesizes the pearls of traditional medicine with cutting edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality. Welcome, Dr. Orloff. We are so happy to have you here today. I think you have the most beautiful heart and your, I think our missions are very similar and I'm really excited to welcome you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm honored to speak to your community of HSPs and empaths and sensitive, loving, caring people. Yes, and you are definitely one of those. I, I've um, come across your work several times. You are one of the first people to introduce me to the idea of being an empath. And as a psychotherapist, I really was in this lane of, I need to stay in sort of this lane, the scientifically proven trait of high sensitivity. I wanna make sure that the medical community takes it seriously and the um, psychology community takes it seriously. And the more I learned about my trait and was able to balance myself better in the world, uh, I started to explore the empath side of me. And I, I find it really fascinating and I'm really excited to be able to talk with you today about really what it is even that it means to be an empath. So maybe we even start there with some people that are new to learning about it. So as a conventionally trained physician, you are also an empath. What is an empath and what yeah. is the neuroscience mm -hmm. findings that explain the empath experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I'm a, a psychiatrist. I'm in private practice. I see patients. I'm also on the clinical faculty at UCLA and occasionally uh, supervise psychiatric residents. And um, I'm also an empath. And so I combine my traditional psychiatric skills, which I so love and so honor, um, with the ability to use my intuition and sense and know and read people's energy and get nonlinear information from my patients that I can integrate with what I also get from my linear mind. So as a therapist, I combine both, which is, you know, a big message that I have. And I have workshops for training healthcare professionals to integrate their beautiful linear training with being an empath. And an empath is somebody who doesn't have the same kind of filters that other people have. We're like super responders and super sensitive, and we don't have the same kind of defenses up or the ability to dissociate like other people have. So we're more wide open to the world. And overall, I think that's a really fantastic thing. I mean, I wouldn't give it up for anything. I love being an empath. I love sensing and knowing and feeling and, and connecting, you know, with people, with nature, with you know, every, the world, life, I, lo I love connection and the depth of connection and being an empath can give you that. However, empaths are also emotional sponges. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to absorb in information and energy from other people. And if you don't have the proper tools that I, I've, you know, written about, you can get exhausted, go on sensory overload, not know how to set boundaries and just feel overwhelmed and sick from the gift. Yes. which is not how you want to feel. And it's not necessary to feel that way, but we must learn certain skills, you know, and I practice them every day. You know, I wrote a book called Thriving as an Empath every single day of the year, a different self-care tool, which I read, which I, which I use, you know, all the time because it has to work. These techniques have to work so I can enjoy myself and I can honor my empath needs at the same time as being of service without burning out. So it just takes, you know, some self-care skills and some meditation exercises and practices in order to find your center over and over again and know what to do if you start absorbing other people's stuff. I, you know, I love that you just said that because we were just talking before we started recording about that every 
HSP empath that I know that is doing well and thriving has a daily practice. It's not something we can skip. And I used to be somebody that was so overwhelmed with life um, and sick all the time, just like you were saying. And I really thought like, I can't do the things I want to do because I'm so overwhelmed until I really started the daily practice. Like you're talking about the daily mindfulness, time in nature every day, time alone every day, all these things have, you know, and, and self-compassion, learning self-compassion, because we can be really hard on ourselves naturally, which is surprising that we're, we're so compassionate with others. Um, so I love, you know, what you are representing in the world, I think is so incredibly powerful that you share. I've, I've heard you, we've been on some summits together with the, at, at the uh, Shift Network, and I've heard you talk about things from your personal background and your perspective. And I just think that it's so powerful that you share your real stories and how I was hearing you talk about once about like even the distance that we're doing right now, you know, in lines and stuff is kind of nice as an empath that we don't have to be right next to each other all the time. I love that about you. This is a dream come true. I always want people to stay, keep away from me, you know, in public places. I, that's my dream come true that they stay away and they still don't stay away. They still, you know, they do all kinds of things to not keep the distance, but I love it because I have more of a free space around me, free sky, free air, free energy, just to be me as I go through, let's say the market, you know, go and shop. I don't want someone else's energy imposing on mine. So I love the social distancing. But I also love not having it with, yeah. you know, with friends, you know, the hugging is what yeah. I've missed, you know, in the pandemic and the loving and the, you know, you get that from animals, you get that from your little bubble of people, but, you know, just the, you know, the wonderful hugs that you yeah. get, you know, from loving people, you know, those are the yeah. good kinds of touch, you know, the so, so nurturing, you know, to have love. Um, so that's been a downside of the pandemic for me as an empath, but the upside has been having the space, you know, I always want people to stay away from me, you know, a lot of the time. I, I love how, how you talk about this. Are there actually neuroscience findings about, the, about being an empath? Yeah, in the empath survival guide, there's a whole section on the science of being an empath. Wonderful. And what's fascinating is they, you know, the, the neuro, the mirror neuron systems, which are the neuronal system in the brain and the body responsible for compassion. And it's been shown that with really empathic, loving people, empaths, they tend to have hyperactive mirror neuron systems, meaning they're working too hard. <laughs> it's time to be compassionate, you know, as opposed to, let's say, a narcissist or a sociopath or a psychopath who have empathy deficient disorder and their mirror neuron systems are underperforming. So I find that very fascinating that our neurology reflects our compassion or actually imbues us with compassion. Yeah. And the other interesting point is with dopamine, the pleasure hormone, it's been found that sensitive people and quiet introverted people need less dopamine to get the kind of blissful feeling that you get from the, the pleasure hormone and people who are not HSPs and empaths, they need to get a bigger, you know, boost. They need to go to the, you know, the Rolling Stones concert or the football game or, or some kind of big boost of dopamine to feel the surge. But we, you know, introverts or even extroverted empaths, we don't need as much dopamine because we feel satisfied reading a book. We feel satisfied watching the ocean. We feel yeah. satisfied walking in the forest. We don't need a big loud band to start feeling good. Oh yeah, that those internal like reflection places like where you're looking at a sunset or into the face of your beloved pet or something. It's like such a beautiful experience. I know for myself, I'm just at that top highest level. I, I experience all of that so much and I've learned how to to sort of fill up that positivity tank inside of me more so through that. And it's really been life-changing to do that too. What are the different types of empaths and some of the gifts? Yeah, 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 they're great. There, there are many different types. There's overall the introverted and the extroverted empath and the ambivert. The ambivert is a mixture of introversion and extroversion. 
the extroverted empath likes to go out and socialize, but also does need to decompress. They're not like the regular extrovert. They need to decompress. They need to have their quiet time. And then there's the introverted empath like me. I'm really, really introverted. And um, I, you know, prefer, I'm a writer. I like to stay in a room for years on end writing and being quiet yeah. and walking by the ocean and being with one or two people versus large amounts of people. So, I, you know, I'm an introverted empath and many empaths are. And then the, the types of empaths, there's emotional empath, somebody who tends to have a knack of picking other people's emotions up. You can just sense if someone's angry or depressed or, or not okay and you just sense it really quickly and you might absorb it into your body and start feeling it too. Um, there's uh, the intuitive empath. This is a, an empath that's very astutely attuned to their intuition and there are different types. There could be a plant empath where you really vibe with plants and you can communicate with the, you know, the plant world or animal empath who vibe with the animal world and can communicate and talk and love and be and it's like a family member because you're so connected yeah. you know the animal empath and I think there's an ocean empath I'm certainly an ocean empath the ocean has been you know one of my main companions my whole life mm -hmm. and I see it as a companion you know I don't yeah. see it as just a body of water out there I see it as you know a live organic organism system that's loving me and I'm connecting with. So mm -hmm. you might be an ocean empath, you might be an earth empath, somebody who can feel the changes of the earth. Um, so, you know, there are many different kinds of empaths um, and you need to kind of tune in to what you are, what, what is your baseline? And then how would you like to expand? Because even if you aren't, let's say a, a plant empath, you know, but you want to explore, you could spend time with plants. You can, you know, begin to meditate with plants. You say, you know, plants communicate with each other. Yeah. Um, nature communicates with each other. It's not like they're just inert. So there's life everywhere. And empaths can feel that. And that's so mind blowing, you know, that we could feel that. Yeah. Um, other people might not be able to feel it. And if you share it with the wrong people, they might say, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? But that's just how it is. That the non-empath sometimes can't feel it, what you can feel. Just so you know that like my partner can't feel this. You know, my partner doesn't, you know, absorb energy and emotions like I do. And I love them. You know, I love the grounding for me. I don't someone else doing what I do. I'm so fluid and connecting all the time. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we sound so similar. I mean, everything that you've been saying, I've been nodding my head in agreement. I, I feel like we have the same experience in life. Um, and it's so, I think, powerful for you to even, for people to hear you say that it's like other people might not feel everything that you're feeling and that's okay. And it doesn't mean that what you're feeling is wrong or, 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 or anything like that. In fact, the world needs you to feel these things. Um, and I, I warn everybody as, you know, something I've been told, you know, all my life and it just drives me crazy is that, you know, they say, you're the only one who feels that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I go, that's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. If I have one patient who has one side effect from a, from something and they're feeling it, they're feeling it. There's yeah. no discussion. You know, I don't care if no one else has felt it. I, I'm feeling it. And so, you know, to go into a doctor and the medical profession, they're saying, hey, you're the only one who's ever felt that way. It doesn't exist. You know, it does exist. So it's just something that, that comes up with empaths because we feel things and we respond to things at such lower doses, you know, of many medications. Like, you know, we, we require less of everything yeah. in many cases. I'm not going to get into the medication discussion, but just remember that. You might need a little bit less, so you might want to experiment with a little bit less to see if it's effective. Yes, 100%. I'm a big believer in advocating for our needs with our medical and mental health professionals because we, we do have a different set of needs. Um, and, you know, just thinking about what you were saying, how like as kids and now we just absorb everything. If, if we're thinking about how do we... Because as empaths, I think because we do naturally absorb everything, being emotions and physical symptoms of others, 
how do we protect ourselves? Um, I've learned how to do that, but I think it'd be so powerful to hear how you've done it and how you teach people to do it. How do you really um, protect yourself so you can enjoy the gifts of sensitivity? Oh yeah, I mean, there's so many things that I do every single day. I mean, energy management is key. Yeah. You know, tuning into your body every day and saying, how am I feeling? How is my energy level? And then trying to honor that throughout the day so you don't go over a red line and you're not doing more than you can do that your body wants to do because that causes disharmony, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms. I know when I intuitively, I know when I go over my red line and I'm still going in that direction and it's yeah. dangerous, I have to pull it back. Otherwise I'm gonna pay a price. Something's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You know, my back's gonna go out, something I'm gonna trip and, you know, hurt something, you know, just, I know when my red line, so everybody tune into your body, listen to your body, don't ignore it. If you need to rest, at least rest five minutes, you know, maybe you don't have time to rest for three hours, but just rest. And also um, going in water, <clears throat> baths are incredibly cleansing for me and, and energetically, as well as, you know, all kinds of ways, you know, just getting, immersing yourself in water, being by water, drinking water, putting water on your face. Um, that's very, you know, cleansing for me. I am a meditator. It's my primary spiritual practice. I meditate every night and it brings me back to center and empaths lose energy and become frantic because they're dispersed. Their energy is dispersed. But if you meditate and I meditate a heart centered meditation where I come back to my heart every night and I have a, an altar, I have candles, I have fruit, I have incense, I have Kuan Yin, I have, my altar is my sacred space, truly. And I'm quiet and I'm alone there. And it's my time to commune with spirit and come back to Judith, 100% Judith, if I'm off in other places so that I can recalibrate. Very, very important. And another technique is learning how to set clear boundaries with people. Yes. I've become very good at this. Um, I've had to. And sometimes it's awkward when you when you set a clear boundary with people. Like, you know, I, I never really like shaking hands with people because I can feel the energy transferred through the hand. So when people would come up to me, this was before the pandemic, because they don't really shake hands now, thank God. <laughs> I just have to say, I completely agree with you about that. <laughs> I would have to say to people, I don't really shake hands. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, they didn't quite know what to do. With them. <laughs> but, you know, it's, you just have to do things like that that might seem a little odd to other people. But to you, if, if you say it matter of factly, you set your boundaries, short, clear, matter of fact, then people kind of go along with it. You know, and especially people who respect you and know you, they, they need to go along with it. You know, if you say, I can only talk for five minutes and they want to keep you on the phone for an hour and you don't have it to give, you have got to say, you know, I love you. You're my friend. I just don't have it right now. I've got to go. You know, I've got to go. I'm so sorry. And that's hard for empaths because empaths are people pleasers. Yes. They want everyone to be happy. They have a hard time with other people being disappointed in them, you know, and I, I just want to say it, it's just part of life. People are going to be disappointed when you set a boundary sometimes, and that's okay. You don't have to please everyone all the time, but you can be respectful, and it's about self-care. It's not selfish, but empaths can get tired. They really can, and if you get tired or you go on sensory overload, where too much is coming at you too fast, you've got to decrease your stimulation very quickly. You can't keep going on. You've got to stop. And if you're in a social gathering and, and you're feeling it, you need to go in the bathroom yeah. you know, for five, 10, 15 minutes, slow it down, breathe, center, come back to yourself, speak your name, 100% Julie, you know, 100% Marianne, um, hundred percent who you are to bring it back again. Don't disperse your energy, bring it back to center. So those are a few of the techniques and boundaries are key. Yes. You, you cannot practice self-care without 
learning how to set clear, firm, short boundaries without getting into confrontations with people. Yes. I, wow. I feel like you're speaking my language because I say the same thing about the presented in a matter of fact way, not in a way like, oh, I think something's wrong with me for asking you of this. Right. I love how you said that. It's strong and it's empowered. And it's for me, I really had to learn how to love my inner child because I did not even know her. I was in my 40s by the time I got to know her. And it completely changed my life. And a big part of it now is like, I'll I'll, I'll think about that external versus internal focus. And I'm like, if I'm setting a boundary and, and somebody has a problem with it, it usually means that they need that boundary. <laughs> and I have to pay attention to my inner child because she has these needs that I was ignoring for such a huge part of my life. And it wasn't until I paid attention to her needs that my life changed. And it took time to get to know her and to, and to like her even. And now I love her and I can't imagine life any different, but it was really hard when I didn't. Oh, it's so essential that the HSP reclaims her inner child or his inner child. My inner child is so much a part of my life. I mean, sometimes people say I take photos and I look like I'm about 10, you know, yeah. and I think it's because I'm, you know, in touch with her and I, we have a life that has inner child activities woven into it. You know, like we have stuffed animals that we talk to and that we hug and that, you know, and that we, you know, have this inner child awareness because I have a very strong inner child that, yeah. you know, was shamed when it was little. I was told by my parents who were both doctors and I had 25 physicians in my family, never talk about another one of your dreams or intuitions again at home. So I felt horribly shamed as many mm -hmm. empaths do. And I tell you my story because it's so many of our stories that we were shamed for being overly sensitive yes. you know, or, or to this or not having a thick enough skin, which is not true, but the parents seem to have the same line and they used to say the same thing to everybody, but it's not true. So it's so good for my inner child to have a safe place to be her sensitive, creative, quirky, roadless travel self. Yes, that's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. I, I, I resonate with everything that you're saying. How, you know, one of the questions I get asked the most is what's the difference between an HSP and, M and an empath? Um, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Because it's like, here's our opportunity to talk to someone that is so familiar with the empath world. And I would, I would love to hear what you think about that. Okay. Uh, there's a spectrum of empathy. There's regular, beautiful empathy, which is, I feel what you're feeling. Um, I feel your pain. I feel your joy. Um, and then higher up on the spectrum is the HSP, who has all the sensory um, sensory openness to light, smell, sounds, taste, um, people, and HSPs are usually quiet and introverted, um, and they're just expanded sensory beings. They don't necessarily absorb the energy of others. They may, but not necessarily. And then if you go a little bit higher on the spectrum of, of empathy, then you have the empath who has all the HSP qualities of being the sensory awareness, you know, the super sensory being. Um, plus, they sense the energy coming from other people acutely. Energy, subtle energy is their first language, and they tend to absorb it, which causes all kinds of problems. Yes. Um, and so that's why you need the self care. So it's just a matter of intensity and the absorption. You know, the empaths just are born absorbing, they're born, they're open, you know. And little babies coming out of the womb. You can tell an empath baby because they're just so open. They're like this. Their hands are feeling the energy and up and, you know, and, and, and other babies come in the world. <clears throat> I'm going to, you know, run a corporation and you can tell they're just contained. You know, it's, it's a different energy. One is not better than another. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that it's you know, we're different and that's okay. Yeah. You know, don't judge the non HSPs, the non empaths. Don't judge them. They're they can be beautiful people. 
And we're, and we're so needed. That's it. We were just talking about somebody had a question before we recorded about leadership and, you know, why we don't see more HSP empaths and leadership roles. And I really, I'm interested in a paradigm shift where we start to value sensitivity and the gifts that it brings to the world and how much it's needed in leadership roles, policy making. Uh, we need we need the voices of HSP empaths in the world and we need the empathy that they bring to everything that they do, right? Absolutely, but you need, you, you can't be an empathic HSP leader unless you have very strong boundaries, very strong self-care. I mean, you've really got to ground yourself. You've got to do that. You can't go in just absorbing the energy of all the people around you, that won't work. So if you practice you know, just as part of your spiritual development, I mean, I look at all this as extremely spiritual and it's connecting us to a larger energy, um, the energy of love or whatever you want to call it. Um, and if we can be comfortable opening to it at the same time, comfortable with our ability to protect ourselves and set the boundaries, then we can become trusted leaders, servant leaders, you know, in service to a cause, not an egotistical, narcissistic, maniacal leader, but someone in service to a cause. And, you know, especially when it comes to climate change and anything to do with the earth, you know, I've written about this and I feel strongly about it, that empaths and HSPs are the guardians of the earth. We're, yes. the, we're the ones that are prepared because we can feel what's going on. Yes. And we, we know we have the love of the earth we feel the interconnectivity of all beings and all sentient life, animals, plants, people, even if we don't know them, they're suffering across the globe. We can feel it, yes. you know, so that's why we're the perfect people to be guardians of the earth. Yes, I love this so much. I completely would agree with you. And I, we were just saying too, it's like we have to do things differently and and we can't do what we're, you know, we're being shown leaders are supposed to work, work, work and hustle, hustle, hustle. And, it's, and you never take downtime, you never take breaks and you, it, that is it's not going to work and it's not what we need. And we have to reframe it and go into a different way of being as leaders. And I'm so like thrilled to hear you saying this and validating all of these things too, that Self-care on a daily basis has to be part of our practice if we're going to be able to give those gifts to the world. Um, so I'd love to <clears throat> ask you about misdiagnosis. So why are empaths often misdiagnosed with sensory processing disorder, major depression and panic attacks? And what is the correct diagnosis? Well, you know, one of my missions is to help physicians and other healthcare professionals correctly diagnose empaths. So it's part of their uh, history and physical protocol that they think empath. And I think one of the things I'm going to ask for is how, you know, their sensitivity level, patient sensitivity level. And I, you know, I have workshops for that if any of you are, are interested in it. Um, but the reason that empaths are so notoriously misdiagnosed is that Physicians or healthcare practitioners don't know about subtle energy yeah. and they don't understand or believe that there's a subtle energy that flows through our body and extends beyond our body that certain human beings can sense this and it has huge impact on their health and well being. So they don't know how to diagnose an empath. So all they see are the secondary symptoms, which can be anxiety, sensory overload depression, fibromyalgia, pain, it's all too much. I wanna be a recluse. Um, I get anxious when I go outside. Um, I have pain in my body that people can't diagnose. I'm, I'm tired. Um, what else? I mean, there's so many different symptoms that an empath can feel. And the, the wrong diagnosis is major depression or panic disorder. That's not the primary diagnosis, usually if you're an empath. To find out, I mean, you have to start with self-care techniques for empaths. Diagnosis of an empath, there's a 20 question self-assessment test that you can give people or take yourself in the front of my empath survival guide. And that will tell you how much of an empath you are or if you're not an empath. You're not an empath, you're not an empath, and that's fine. You know, you're not an HSP, that's fine. You're, you're different, it's different. But if you are, 
You have to be diagnosed as an empath and deal with everything you experience through that lens. And when you are seen through that lens, you're given these self-care techniques to, to lower your anxiety, to center yourself, to learn how to set boundaries, to learn how to deal with the shame you're carrying around, to learn if you've had you know, narcissistic abuse as a child and that's affected your, your ability to defend your energy and protect it. There are all kinds of empath specific topics that I go through with my patients in psychotherapy. And when they're dealt with, the, the symptoms always get better. That's not yeah. to say that you might not have an overlying disorder too. I mean, you might have something else in addition to that and that you need to address. But first and foremost, you need to address whether you're an empath and how to contain your energy and center and ground your energy a little bit more so you can you know, feel empowered rather than just sick and tired. Oh, this is so powerful that you're talking about this as a doctor. Um, I agree with you. I've seen over the years, um, I don't work with clients one-on-one -on -one now, but over the years, I specialized in working with uh, people with a trait of high sensitivity. And I could not believe how many people came into my office with, you know, they, they went to their doctor, they said, I feel this, they get given medication that really makes it worse for them and that they didn't need. And within often a week or two of learning what works for them as an HSP empath, it was, it's incredibly profound how quickly an HSP empath can make things better when they're given this right kinds of information. So to, to try these things before medication, to try natural things uh, is so powerful and to make sure that you have professionals that believe you, right? That believe that this is a real thing and because it is, and we need more professionals like you in the world for sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm doing my part to try and train them. Um, so, and you are too, and that's, and, and it's trainable. Yeah. You know, I have a course, Become an Intuitive Healer, that's on my website, which you could download, you know, if you're interested in some of the skills to do this. It's, it's all skill-based and it's all educational. And it, it's about also opening up your own energy. You know, at, as a healer, you just don't heal with your mind. Yes. And I feel, I'm open with my patients. I feel their energy. My body is sensing and feeling, giving me information, you know, but I'm not absorbing. So, you know, my, you know, people say, how can you see five patients a day? Because that's actually my limit. I can't see any more than that. <laughs> I couldn't do it every day. But, you know, I, how do you not absorb? Because I, I find a, a, a rhythm that works for me mm -hmm. and I space them out, you know, and if it, if I start absorbing people, it's no fun anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and, but I want to say that as a healer, you know, I, you have to look at your emotional triggers because that's part of the healing, the healer heals, mm -hmm. wounded healer heals. That part of working with people is sometimes you're gonna be triggered. And when you're triggered, which means, you know, it's your button, let's say your mother criticized you and you're perceiving someone else is criticizing you. So you're all riled up. You have to go back to the original mother, you know, and begin to heal that, that criticism. When you do, um, you're not so triggered by other people. So you absorb what you haven't worked out yourself. I know we're going through a lot of information here, but knowing your emotional triggers is very, very important. Defense, non-defensively saying, yes, I have that trigger. I'm still healing it. It's never too late. You know, when people say, oh, I'm 70 years old. I still have the trigger about my mother. Like, great, just keep working on it. It's not age related. It's like, it comes up over and over and over and over again, get used to it. You know, you just go, okay, like Ram Dass says, ah, oh, fear, my old friend. <laughs> hey, don't worry about it. You know, just deal with what comes up so you can keep clearing, clearing, and then you become less reactive and people can't put the, the you know, the knife in your heart so much. Yes. You, know, not, you just don't respond in the same way. You're like, hmm, 
that the ouch that doesn't feel good but it's not like oh my god that's so horrible so yes oh my gosh i love this it, i used to just fall apart for weeks if somebody said anything that sounded like criticism and it had so much to do with the fact that i I didn't accept myself or love myself and really working on that. And it definitely took time. And I love that you're talking about this as a process that we have people in the sensitive empowerment community in their eighties joining saying, this is the first time that they've started to love themselves. I mean, that's the most beautiful thing ever and it's possible and it does take work and it's a journey. And I'm always sharing, there's no such thing as perfection, but we just keep, keep practicing it. And you're such a beautiful example. I mean, you have so many wonderful resources. And um, I want to ask uh, a question that came in before we started today that I thought was really powerful. And I also want to tell the people in the community that are with us live, you could put in some questions now. Um, I might only be able to get to a little bit of the questions, but I want to give time to the people that gave that are here with us live. So this question I thought was so powerful and beautiful and it came it comes from Syra that says I love Dr. Orla what is and she's asking you this question what is your greatest vision for the role of empaths in the world in your lifetime and beyond and how can we as a collective support continue your important voice in the field mm, that's beautiful yeah My vision is for empaths to awaken and come into their power and be able to be in different positions in life so that they're represented, you know, in terms of different ways of doing things. It's a very different world if empath HSPs are, are part of it. I mean, I, I don't think they should be all of it, you know, but it needs to be a, a balance of different types of people, the intellectuals, the empaths, you know, the, the uh, more physically, you know, physical, and just the, the balance of humanity working together. Mm -hmm. See, we can all do it in, in different ways, but I do, my dream is to have empaths and HSPs in leadership roles, you know, as physician in politics, you know, in corporations, in small businesses, but in leadership roles, able to handle it. Yes. You know, and, if they're not able, you know, if they have a bad day, then to go home and get themselves together, but not have that stop them. Yes. Oh, we have to say, we have to make this happen. <laughs> we just have to make this happen. And it's a grassroots movement, isn't it? It is. That's what I love grassroots. So, so that's the most exciting to me, the grassroots movement. I like the people. Yes. Uh, like people, small groups, Flash, 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 they're all growing, but it's small and it's growing and it's organic and it's the people. It's not some somebody up here telling you what to do. You know, yes. it's like this the, the people's needs. Oh my gosh, I just I just imagine envisioning a world like that. I always had this dream that we'd get to the point where this is even something we put on our resumes, that it is part of the gifts that we yeah. offer. I was actually interviewed on a, a leadership podcast and the by two people and one of them was not an HSP and he was sharing how much he relied on and valued his HSP partner in the in these meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me and it was really powerful because he was aware that like after the meeting he would meet with her who was an HSP and probably an empath too um, and he would say like he was aware that he would miss all kinds of stuff that she picked up on and I was like this is so powerful for for us to be talking about this right that's great well, I don't know if any of you saw um, Star Trek Next Generation there was a character Deanna Troy who was an empath and she had a particular role on the ship and people would go to her, you know, so what do you feel? What, you know, what is your take on this? So she was one of the consultants there and the actress did, I forget her name, but she did a beautiful job, you know, with this. So it, it's been in science fiction, you know, we just oh. need to bring it in everyday life. I love that so much. I, I saw on a, on a show it was a, about it was like in a in an emergency room situation and one of the doctors was definitely an hsp and he was aware that he needed to he was also a surgeon and he needed to preserve 
his balance to have really good focus on these surgeries. And the other doctors were running around saying, how can you take a break right now? And he was like, because I'm preparing myself to be my best <clears throat> for my role as a surgeon. And I was like, wow, we get to see more of this because yes, this is exactly what we need to do and advocate for ourselves. <laughs> oh, I love this so much. No, that's beautiful. I want to say that I saw an episode with an empath on a show called The Good Doctor recently. They shared it in my empath group on Facebook and I didn't like it at all. It was about this poor woman in the ICU who was picking up on everybody's stress and her heart was beating so fast that she had a heart attack from being an empath. And it was just such a victim role to put an empath in and and you know, people were going, oh, there's an empath episode on TV, but it was the wrong message. You know, it was like this poor, frail person who was just being victimized by other people's troubles. And it just wasn't, I didn't like the way it was portrayed. You know, this is a good example of how we actually need HSP empaths in, in writing for shows too. I mean, this is there's so many areas that we need you because it, it shows up so much in representation. I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and now you're seeing more representation on TV and in movies. And it's a huge difference to see that, to see yourself on TV in a, in a role that shows that you can be this empowered leader that you can give to the world. Um, it, it's so powerful to have that kind of representation. And I think a good example of how we need HSP empaths in many different fields, don't we? I mean, this, like, this would make a big difference in the world. So all you creatives out there listening, let's start making this happen. <laughs> yeah, I love absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But it's just, you know, so easy to misportray this and not, not do it accurately and then create the wrong impression. Yes. Yes, I love this. Um, let me ask a question from the community. Anu says, um, as an HSP empath, how do you set boundaries with someone you love so dearly, but have an enmeshed relationship? Yeah, that's hard, isn't it? Um, well, you, you have to, t if you love the person dearly and you're really close with them, you have to tell them this is what you're working on is setting boundaries. And it's really hard for you and you want to start practicing with them, is that okay? And so if you bring them into it a little bit, then they're like, well, I don't know. But you know, you, you can just begin to practice and say, the first thing I'm going to practice is learning how to say no. And that no is a complete sentence. That's one of my self-care mantras. No is a complete sentence. And to say, honey, no, I'm so sorry. I need to spend some alone time now. I can't be with you. You know, in, in practice, don't start with your mother. I warn you, everybody, don't start with your mother. Don't do it because she's the hardest. You know, the mothers are the hardest. They know how to press your buttons, don't they? They know exactly what to do. Start with someone easier. You know, maybe a friend who would understand. Because I know I've worked with so many people, and they go right to their mothers, and that's doomed. You don't. You need practice before you get to the mother. That's like the epicenter. <laughs> Center. They know what to do. That's their job. That's good. Start a little bit away from the epicenter and move in. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, we'll go to one more question. I know we're running uh, low on time. Do you think that empaths and HSPs are more at risk for autoimmune disease? Um, this is a question I actually hear a lot, and I see a lot of autoimmune issues in this population. I do. I do. They're, they're open to so many things, but autoimmune, you know, is so sensitive. It's so tender. It's when the body turns against itself. And if you have any early symptoms of autoimmune disease, you have to stop. You've got to reevaluate your life and make it a life that is going to support you. And you're not doing things that are, are wrong for your body. You know, it's about intense inner listening. It's about making radical changes in your life and honoring your empath self, because if the body goes haywire and it starts attacking him, her, her, him or herself, you know, you want to deal with any ways you attack your own self in your mind, because I know what goes on up here in people. Yeah. The self-loathing, the putting yourself down, I'm not enough, I need to be, you know, all that you need to work with. You need yeah. the mind, anything that is putting you down or attacking you you need to work, begin immediately to little by little work with it and do an inventory, find out 
what am I, you know, how am I contributing to this and begin to shift the energy and then maybe go to the organ that's involved. This is the whole working with autoimmune disease is the whole, whole thing. You go to the organ that's involved, that's getting attacked and you begin to put love into it. You begin to relax it. You begin to listen to what it's telling you. You know, it's really a lot of inner listening to what yeah. the organs have intelligence, every organ. You know, the liver, the GI tract, the uterus, the throat, everything. You want to, when, when something is off with it, you want to begin to tune into it and listen to its messages. So it's a whole art form learning how to work with the body. You know, so that's a, a yeah. larger question. But yes, I do see an association oftentimes. And we have amazing ability to read our bodies. This is a, a skill that is, you know, we're extra good at if we are slowing down to listen. And so I think that's so important. And as we wrap up, I love to um, have the community go ahead and share anything you would like me to read to Dr. Orloff uh, about what this meant to you today to have time with her and even just to feel this energetic space together. What a beautiful thing. So I'll, I'll read some of those as they come in. Um, and in the meantime, Dr. Orloff, uh, tell us how can HSP Empaths find you and what do you recommend? I mean, you have an amazing amount of resources and books and courses and what do you recommend and how can they find you? Well, my website is www.drdrjudithorloff, O-R-L-O-F-F. -F dot com and i invite you all to a mini self-care retreat i'm giving on july 17th zoom two and a half hours you can register on my website it's a time for all of us to come together and practice self-care and replenish and protect our energies and deal with our blocks and so every, everyone is invited it's on my home page you can sign up there and um you know, I've noticed some of the questions on the chat is about or about narcissism. I have an online course uh, on uh, protecting yourself from narcissists. You know, I, I have a lot of online kind of stuff that you can, you know, just get. And I, I'm teaching it so you can watch it at your convenience. And I have an online course, the Empath Survival Guide online course, a seven module video course. So there's so many different, whatever you resonate with, the book, The Empath Survival Guide, if you like Day at a Time, Thriving as an Empath. If you like a journal, I have the Empath Empowerment Journal. I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been busy creating. So I have a lot of different things I love to create. So there's a lot of different options. You just go to my website and you could just see, see what resonates, see what you get pulled to and go for it. Don't go uh -huh. to yourself. I love that. And your, your call to do it, probably. I feel that too. I get this downloading of right information. I'm like, you're supposed to do this. You'll have to create this. It's like, it, it's coming from that intuition and that part of the empath part and, and being Enjoy. able to see. Enjoy. Yes. Enjoy. Yes. Oh, it's so beautiful. Um, and I want to share something that you wrote too, that you, you talked about that you wanted people to receive today. I thought it was so beautiful. You said, I feel passionately that empathy is the medicine the world needs right now. Empathy will be the deciding factor between war and peace, between hatred and tolerance. Empathy is the game changer. It is the trait that will ultimately save the world. Beautiful, beautiful. And I completely agree with you. And let me share some of the love coming from the community. Uh, Christy says, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Mai says, this was a very enlightening meeting. I'm so glad I intended. Learn things I didn't understand before. Um, <clears throat> such empowerment gained here, Becca shares. I feel stronger to, to stay my special self. I love that. Uh, Cecilia says, thank you so much for joining us today and shining a light into the world by educating on empathy. I love your books, uh, Empath Survival Guide and Thriving as an Empath. You're an inspiration and a mentor. And so many thank yous and blessings. And uh, we're going to be putting all of this into the into the special chat box. And, uh, and you also shared uh, this free gift guide that was amazing. I'm going to share with the community a self-care practices for empaths and sensitive people. That is amazing. And what a wonderful resource. So I'll be putting that into it too. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we say goodbye today? 
I just sense a lot of courage in this group. And, you know, I know there are challenges to being an empath, but I think it's really important that you tune into your courage um, to, to persevere and to keep moving towards the light, no matter what personal challenges you're, you're going through. You just continue through the personal challenges. You don't stop. You, you go through. Life is very challenging, you know, at times. It goes up and down. Sometimes it's easier than others. But whatever is happening, you want to be calm in the midst of chaos. Remember that. Yeah. Calm in the midst of chaos. And there's chaos, you know, so be the calm. And we could all do that together. And we could think of each other. I'm a big believer in, in remembering gatherings like this and feeling the energy and having an imprint on us so we don't feel alone and we can tap into each other's courage. But this group is very courageous and that's the, the main thing that I'm picking up from the group. Yes, it is a beautiful group. I mean, it, it's really incredible to see what happens when you get a group of HSPs together. It's, yeah. it's magical <laughs> actually, <laughs> and you know that. Oh, you are such a gift to the world. And I wanna thank you for your time today. And it was really a pleasure spending time with you and experiencing energy with you. And I just wanna thank you for everything that you're giving to the world. You're changing so many lives and your work is so important. And I wanna encourage everybody to go visit your website and check out your books and your courses and all your beautiful material that you share and the content that you create. Thank you so much for who you are in the world. You're so welcome and thank you all for your beautiful feedback. I see it in the chat, I'm taking it in and it's just um, just such a joy to connect with you all. You know, we're all, we're all in this together. So yes. you know, it's good to find a group like this and, and thank you, Julie, for creating such a beautiful group and holding the energy as you do. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, this was such a beautiful experience to spend time with you. And I'm so excited that the, the HSP podcast is going to share this with the HSP world. And I'm so excited about that. We're going to upload it now into the podcast so everybody can listen to it. And if you want to, if you want more information about everything that we've been sharing, you can go to hsppodcast.com. You can also check out our sensitive empowerment community um, and all the resources that I have on my website that's dedicated to HSPs. You can go to juliebeellen.com or sensitiveconnection.com. And we'd love to invite you to join us. And uh, thank you again, everybody for being here. You're such, a, such beautiful gifts to the world. Please know that you have so much value in the world, that we really need you in the world and all the gifts that come with being an HSP empath. We just adore you and I love this community so much. So thank you everybody for being here and sharing yourselves and your beautiful energy. Until we meet again, everybody, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.